So this is going to be a talk on computer vision, so like more applied field of machine learning, with a particular focus on human bodies, like, um, and a lot of videos and pictures of people. So why humans? People are everywhere in those scenes that's uh, in our daily lives, in some applications like self-driving cars or sports analysis. And more and more applications include surveillance scenarios with some uh, security cameras, again, self-driving cars. These days, a lot of effort into robotics. Um, there's also crowd analysis from similar to surveillance. In healthcare, also, we want to analyze humans' um, interactions, uh, for example, in surgeries. There's assisted living um, scenarios like smart homes, video indexing, searching on YouTube, uh, analyze, uh, like organizing the data, the videos, uh, most of the time, and human-computer interaction like gaming or, um, yeah, in general, interfacing with humans and computers. Uh, so in computer vision, this has been done in two main directions, I would say. Like, one is looking at human dynamics in videos, so like labeling something like this on a YouTube video into an action class, dancing or uh, standing, for instance, for this guy. Um, and we call this action recognition, typically. Um, and another direction is more the low-level task at looking at what is the 3D configuration of the human body shape, where are the arms and, and legs. So this is like pose estimation for human body. Um, so like before I go into more like uh, what, is, what I'm working on, let me just introduce a few challenges why this is um, difficult, because we have a pretty good consensus on how we represent some data, like images are like a grid of pixels, but for humans, we, couldn't, we still don't have a consensus on how to represent human bodies to computers. So there's, these are several alternatives, for instance, um, from left to right, I will say it's uh, getting more recent representations. The skeleton is like the most basic but quite efficient way, like some points on the body, on the joints. These could be in 2D or 3D, or similar to pixels, you can have voxels. So a grid of 3D quantized into bins, and you can say if one, if it's inside the body, zero outside, so this is gonna give you the shape of a human body. There's point clouds, one point for each vertex of, of the, the, the mesh, or parametric representations are uh, recently very popular. So these are very low dimensional representations uh, that um, given the pose and shape parameters in this case, um, outputs a full uh, high dimensional mesh, like the surface around the person body. Um, and more recently, the full mesh is also like uh, the faces and the, uh, the vertices. And in, in each case, you have pros and cons when you want to put them in some learning uh, setting. They have different dimensionalities. They are some linear or nonlinear, so like different difficulties and uh, advantages and disadvantages working with different representations. Um, and just a very, very brief background on what people have been doing in 1970s and 80s. They have already started looking at human. Human body has been always like very popular research topic, um, and initially it was more common to represent bodies into. Uh, like a, a collection of spheres and cylinders, more like geometric primitives. Yeah. Um, and they realize this is too difficult. Um, this is actually like Jeffrey Hinton's first paper, I think, in the 1970s. They went back to 2D structures, like uh, instead of going into this like very complex uh, 3D structures, they said, okay, let's have this skeleton, like stick-like figure, like some lines or rectangles, and just estimate the, the width and like uh, the aspect ratio of a rectangle, which is like very low dimensional and simple. Um, but now the body models that we have, like, and I'm gonna be talking about them in this talk, are much more expressive. Uh, now, like scape and simple in the last, uh, decade have been very popular, and I'm going to be talking about simple. It's a linear model um, that um, parameterizes, decomposes the shape into two uh, param parameters. One is pose 
and the other is shape. So what, what I mean by pose is the um, kinematic deformations due to the posture, and the shape is more the identity specific, like how tall, how fat a person is, those kind of shape deformations. And typically, for instance, this is like 10 dimensional, the other one is 72 dimensional, so this is quite easy to work with. And you can still express a lot of deformations in the body shape. Um, okay, so in this talk, I said I'm going to be talking about humans, but I've divided into three main topics, so these are body shape, hand objects, and human actions. So, as I said, like the low-level task of shape analysis, hand objects is also like a particular part of the human hand that allows us to interact with objects, so this, this has also a lot of research going on on hands only. And then actions is this dynamics I'm going to uh, present briefly. So let's start with body shape analysis, and um, this is some old work from two, two years ago. Uh, we did with, uh, during my PhD, a collaboration with Max Planck Institute in Germany and INRIA in France. And the goal was to, so it's going to be a lot of focus also on synthetic data. The goal was to generate synthetic images for training. So um, we want to use supervised learning setups where we have lab labels, but we don't want to annotate things because for annotating things like depth, how far you are from the camera for each pixel, or segmentation for each pixel, deciding whether it's on your hand or arm. Annotating this manually is impractical or like super expensive. So we want to generate data like this, which I don't know if you can see, is synthetic. That means using things like um, gaming engines, so you can have an avatar and simulate it. And it gives you, the nice thing is that it gives you um, the ground truth, the labels for free. Maybe let me show. Uh, okay, so these are the two tasks I'm going to illustrate this, this data first, segmentation of parts and depth estimation. So we have like a neural network that inputs an image and outputs, uh, let's say, a um, heat map. So like an image, but for every pixel, you assign it to uh, a body part, for instance, and that's the classification problem for, for every pixel. And the way we create training data for that is like, as I said, using this, uh, it could be a game engine or a graphics uh, tool. So in this case, we use um, a software called Blender, which allows you to have a 3D model and then you can render it in 2D and have everything, the, the labels for free. So uh, we have this human body model, as, as I was mentioning before, called Simple. And we make it move with motion capture data. Motion capture is like this studios and green rooms where people put some markers on them and then you have recordings of motions. Uh, and then we have a lot of randomness, like we put random clothes, random camera viewpoint, light, background image, and a body shape randomly, and then you get a random image. So this gives you uh, all this ground truth, like uh, depth, segmentation, pose, 3D normal, surface normals, optical flow, so you can always like train a network and test it on real in your real data. So it wasn't clear whether this, is, this was gonna work. Now it's more and more popular to use synthetic data, but back then we weren't sure if a network trained on this data, how well it's gonna perform on, on real data. Um, so this is like uh, the videos, the uh, typical videos from our data set, which we called Surreal, Synthetic Humans for Real Tasks. Um, so you can see that they are clearly synthetic, but because all the assets come from real images, like the background is real image, but it's just not matching the, the person, what it's doing. Sometimes the person is dancing on a kitchen sink. Um, but still it gives you the pixel statistics that are real. The clothes as well, they come from real scans, and there are thousands of them. Um, we train with this network and see whether we can outperform um, or like even perform anything, training only with synthetic, or another scenario is first pre-train on synthetic, so like get some initial initialization for your neural network, and then fine tune with your limited real data and see if it's better than training only with your real data. So that's the setup for our experiments. 
Um, and we have some data set where we can evaluate this quantitatively, it's, which is called Human 3.6 million data set and Freiburg sitting people data set. Um, you can see that if you train only on real, so this is uh, some segmentation metric, which is higher is better. Um, here, this is a very small data set. So first, only with synthetic data, you can already generalize quite well to, to real in this specific setup where the images are quite clean. And it even outperforms training only on real, which overfits to the training people's t-shirt scholars, for instance. So it doesn't generalize at all. But, but this is like a data set with like a few hundred images. And if you initialize with synthetic training and then continue training with real, it also adapts to the biases of the data, so it's, it gets even better performance. So this is the ground truth. So this is a, a scenario where it's a low, data, uh, raw, low real data regime. And on the right side, you have a data set where you have enough data to train a neural network, but it's a very specific setup as well, so it tends to overfit. Here, in this case, real and synthetic are similar, but synthetic to real is like the worst, the best, sorry. Uh, but if you look closely, like for instance, in this case, the, uh, the guy's t-shirt uh, boundary is a, a assigned as um, the shoulder, although, so that's an indication it's looking at the skin color, but uh, training on synthetic, you have more generalization, like the boundary is supposed to be here instead of here. So it's an indication that there's still some overfitting going on. Uh, so we were really happy like when we first got these results. We also applied it on depth estimation. So for every pixel you assign it to how many meters is it from the camera. So like Kinect, but without any depth sensor, just from RGB cameras. And it was similar in this case, lower is better. And um, yeah, we, we get better results if we initialize with synthetic and fine tune on real. So depth tend to, tend to be a bit difficult than a uh, segmentation task. Um, but yeah, it, it's, it's similar that um, yeah, like synthetic to real was closer, closer to the ground truth. Let me just show a few uh, qualitative results and then move on to, to other things. This was just to convince you that synthetic data can be useful for training. Um, and here you see the predictions below and ground truths above. So the hands and like some precise uh, parts are not so accurate because it's a very low dimensional heat map. It's 64 pixels by 64 pixels. We just show it upsampled. Um, and here some qualitative results on more challenging images, real images training only on synthetic, just to analyze where it fails. So we first note that even in, my, in our training, we don't have occlusion, so the full body is visible. We can, well, thanks to the CNN architecture, actually, like we can deal with some kind of occlusions. But what we cannot deal with is, in this case, is the multi-person cases, where here there are two people, but our network is used to seeing one leg and one, one left leg and one right leg. So it assigns one of the legs to, the one, to one person on the left and the other leg to the right person. Well, this can be easily addressed by adding more and more people in your synthetic data. Uh, and the other case is the dress deformation. So our clothes are pseudo clothes. There is no 3D deformation with the, like the t-shirt or skirt. It's all some texture map, that some colors that you map in your body surface. Um, so in this case, um, it's just assigning the whole dress to be the, the torso of the body, which is all the best it could do. It's, it's a reasonable segmentation. Okay, so like just uh, two take home messages from this work was like synthetic data can be used for training, deep neural networks that require a lot of data. And the other is that typically in one data set you have one label modality. Here you have, as I showed before, like you have depth, segmentation, pose, optical flow, everything together, which can be useful for like other tasks. So let me move on to the other task, which is um, shape estimation. So 3D full shape estimation instead of just pixels, uh, segment segments or depth, which are two and a half D representations. This is the full 3D. So this is a collaboration in, uh, with Adobe 
uh, research in, in Rio, which was published last year. Um, so yeah, like let me just show what is the task. So given an input single RGB image, you have the full body. You want to reconstruct the, the mesh or like the 3D occupancy of the body. And recent works, actually this has been uh, more, more popular since 2016 um, by using, actually there was almost no neural networks in these papers. Uh, you, you use some fitting methods, which is, well, there is a neural network in the sense that it, it gives you some 2D uh, joint positions, and then you optimize with some optimization algorithm to find the best parameters of this body model that fits to your measurements, 2D pose estima estimates in this case. So it was for, uh, the first work that was fully automatic to, that can recover a 3D po 3 human from a, a single image. Um, but then, since 2017 also, we have seen a lot of uh, neural network-based approaches that can input an image and output this low-dimensional parameters of this body model, like 80, 10 plus 72 dimensions as the output of the neural network. So HMR, human mesh recovery, is, for instance, one of the like, state-of-the-art approaches doing that. So um, these are working pretty well, but we wanted to check whether um, we can do better or like we, can we have an alternative representations than the parametric representation. So that was the whole idea of this work, which we called BodyNet. So it's a neural network that um, puts together a few components. Let me just uh, introduce them one by one. So we have, instead of this vector representation of parameters, we have a volumetric representation. So the, the voxels that I showed before in a quantized grid in 3D and um, one inside and zero outside. So then you can say it's a binary classification task. So that's our representation for the final uh, output of the network. And we're gonna show the, the pros and cons of that. Um, another component of this work was their projection loss. I'm gonna, maybe I can explain now, which is constraining the output to be aligned with the segmentation, the silhouette. So projection is going from 3D to 2D, uh, and when you have a volume, you can assume that just collapsing the volume by the depth dimension, by the Z uh, axis, you can get a silhouette. And that's a very efficient um, computation, just this coll collapsing. Um, and then you can, you can give more weight, more importance to the, the silhouette, which is actually what you see in the input image. So the input image has the evidence about the silhouette more than the 3D. So this is like a linear problem, easier problem, and it gives, I'm gonna show it gives much better results when you add this constraint. Um, and the third loss uh, was instead of going directly from an image to an output, we try to make the job of the network easier by guiding it first with easier tasks like 2D pose estimation, localizing the, the joints on the image, and segmentation as we did before. And here we also added another step, which is 3D pose estimation, so localizing on a quantized grid the, the, the joints. He, here they are like shown as Gaussians, so instead of classifying each uh, pixel into um, an XYZ coordinate, we, we say regress to a Gaussian around the location, which gives you some um, uncertainty also helps the, the prediction, sorry. Uh, all right, and then w combined with all this, and experimentally, uh, we show that we get a better performance. So just to illustrate this whole procedure, we have an input image, and the first network gets a segmentation map, a 2D pose map, uh, a 3D pose, and the full mesh later, and each of them has their own loss. Um, and we also extended to show this, instead of having one or zero for the voxels, you can say we can assign them to a body part, so you can have six parts and a background, so you can have a seven-way classification instead of binary classification. Um, and we have an optional step, which is fitting uh, optim with optimization to obtain a parametric model, just in case well, in, in our case, it was to be able to evaluate with other methods, but you might want to um, um, 
yeah, like to, to change, like to manipulate your model, for instance, and parametric models are easier to, to deal with instead of a free form voxel representation. In voxels, you don't know where your arm is, but in a, a parametric representation, you, each vertex is assigned uh, a, a specific place, so it's kind of easier to deal with. Um, so yeah, this is like the overview of the method, and I'm gonna still jump to the experiments, which we perform on the previously shown synthetic data set Surreal, and a new one, United People, which has real images, but uh, semi-automatic ground truth, so it can be noisy, but it allows us to look at real images. So the first thing we check is whether we need this like uh, stack of networks, like different tasks, and we see that the more inputs you have to the shape estimation work, the better performance you get, which is intuitive because if one of the tasks fail on the way, like here the 2D pose estimation fails, but the segmentation gets it right, you can recover from your mistakes. Um, so this was the first, first sanity check that uh, it's better to have this um, connected but like body net architecture. Um, the second thing is the, the reprojection loss I was talking about. So the, the effect of this reprojection loss is that, um, so when you have a classifi classification, binary classification for each voxels, you give them equal weights for each of them. And statistically, the center of the body is always one, but the parts that are moving are more uncertain where they are over the training set. And because of that, we had very good confidence uh, so these are the confidence values of our predictions between one and zero. We had very good confidence in, inside of the voxels, but very poor, un, like a lot of uncertainty on the limbs, which are actually the most informative parts about the person's posture. So the, the, um, the benefit of their projection loss was to give some like uh, more importance, more weight to the surface pixels, surface voxels. Um, and we, we make them more sharper. And if you threshold this at 0 0.5, for instance, you don't lose randomly some parts of your body. Um, so that this was showing that we get to lower is better. We get better uh, lower error when we have front view and side view projection losses, but I'm not gonna go into detail for those. And the other thing was the effect of multitask training. So we had this loss also on 2D pose, 3D pose segmentation, and we can do an end-to-end -end training with all the losses. Like it's seven losses. It's uh, yeah, it can be hard, but even without any tuning, like uh, easily we could get better performance with end-to-end -end in, with intermediate task than no end-to-end, -end, just freezing the first parts of the network and just training the last part. Um, so this was showing that some relevant tasks can help the final task on the way. Um, all right, yeah, so one interesting outcome of this work, like it's, it's not claiming that this is the best representation, but it's trying to analyze what is better and worse about this representation. Uh, one, like a lot of research is go uh, going on is on closed uh, deformations these days. And one thing you cannot do, at least um, in a naive way, with parametric me methods is to model the clothes because it's just an anatomic body, like a uh, skin, skin body. Uh, with voxels, it's quite flexible. You can just deform them as the way you want, and it just depends on how you define the supervision. Like, if your ground truth has the clo clothes as well, then you would also get the clothes. Uh, but currently, at least at the last year, we didn't have any data set with ground truth clothes on them. But here we said we have this reprojection loss, which is on 2D segments, and we have a lot of segmentation data sets. So like, um, we have the ground truth silhouette for this image, which covers the shorts, and instead of putting the 2D reprojection loss on the silhouette like this, we can define it on, on the cloth version, and then we can see that the 3D output also deforms with respect to the, the cloth boundaries. But this is only on the 2D XY plane. When you rotate a little bit, you see that this is more like uh, back to the skinned body model because there was no supervision and the depth dimension. But it was interesting uh, to see. A few qualitative results on real images for volumes and their parametric model fits. Here, because we have um, a linear um, 
relation between the input and output, like pixels and voxels, you can directly reuse the, the color from the image and texture it on your output. That's how we can show them uh, with, cl with colors. And as I said, we extend it to body parts, and this is some qualitative results on, on, on those. And interesting analysis is always looking at where it fails. And the failure cases are typical failure cases of 3D estimation from 2D. It's actually an ambiguous problem. We need to have some priors on how the human body is and how it moves. Otherwise, actually, there is no way you can guess if the person's arm is on, on the belly or like somewhere in front. So when you rotate that, our model is actually like predicting it to be in front. But it's actually the ground truth which is also wrong. As I said, it's semi-automatic, so the ground truth is also failing sometimes. And the other failing cases is similar to before, multi-person. When there is more than one person, the limbs get, especially in the sports images, and we like to work with sports images for some reason, and yeah, like here it's the leg of one person gets to the other, it's completely messed up. And sometimes there are even cases where a body has three legs. Um, yeah, so very weird things happen. Um, so take home messages from, from this work was that the volumetric representation is an effective alternative and we should not forget about it. It's very simple and easy to learn. Um, and flexible. Um, the reprojection loss is, was critical. Like before, we had the reprojection loss. It was we were like depressed that it didn't work, and the moment we added this loss, we were satisfied qualitatively with the results. Um, and the multitask training. So one, if you have relevant tasks for your difficult task, you can break it down to um, the simpler tasks and guide the network. Um, so this was the body shape analysis. So let me move to hand object reconstruction part. So here, yeah, this is another collaboration between Max Planck and INRIA, um, and presented this year at CBPR. <coughs> the final goal is to understand human actions, but as I said, the hands play a very important role into like the interactions, understanding the interactions with the objects and the world in general. And the first step is to we said, let's look at the reconstruction of hands and objects together. And the goal is, given an input image like this, reconstruct the full mesh of the hand and the full mesh of the object. Um, and yet another synthetic data set for training, because this, is, this has no training data that we know of. And yeah, I'm going to talk about a little bit that we also integrate some like loss again on our neural network architecture. These days it's also very popular to have multiple losses in your network um, that are aware of physics. I mean, I'll go back to that later. And when you look at previous works, it's a bit surprising to see that uh, most works focused on object reconstructions alone, like very limited environments, isolated, low, uh, like uh, low quality images, and also very synthetic images. And you, what you input is like an image like this and you try to output a plane and it's always planes and chairs. And we want to go beyond that. We want to have uh, like occlusions and hands also grabbing things and also go beyond like 10 categories of planes and chairs. So we want to have uh, no limits on the object categories. And if you look at the hands on the other, ha other hand, um, they, they also um, focused on isolated hands, even if there's an object, it's just there to challenge the, the image like for, for occlusion purposes, but nobody really, well, until recently, looks at uh, the joint reconstruction of both. And yeah, like this is very old work, which was doing something similar to us back then, which was querying an existing database base and looking at the most similar one, so not really machine learning. And more recently, this year, we see a concurrent work dealing with the same problem. So, oops, what happened? All right. Okay, so what we proposed was this neural network architecture that I broke into three components so that it's easier to explain is to have a hand model branch. So we have an input image 
and you want to, uh, here it's a CNN that encodes it into some representation, then some fully connected linear layers here uh, that predicts different things. And here we use, in this case, we use a parametric hand model. Uh, so the previous work I was saying uh, volume, volume is better, but for, for hands in this work it was easier actually to, to deal with uh, parametric models. So the same thing uh, exists, it's called MANO, the, the um, hand model for ha um, like simple body, body model, but for hands. Um, and then you can get a low dimensional estimation and you have a differentiable layer that outputs the vertices and the joints of each finger, and you can put the loss in any of those you want. So there is no learnable parameters in this layer. It's up to here, and then the rest is a feed-forward function. Um, yeah, the second thing is the object reconstruction branch. We use, uh, I'm not gonna go into detail, but an existing work that reconstructs uh, meshes in a continuous function into normalized vertices. So this means like they're in a unit sphere of radius one, and we want them to be in the hand relative coordinates, so we have to also learn a translation and scale to put the object back in the hand. And these are all estimated. And the last con component is this um, physics aware uh, component, which is looking at um, the um, intersection well, more like uh, interpenetration. So you don't want the object to be inside the hand because this is physically not possible. You cannot penetrate into objects. Also, you don't want objects to be flying. You want, if they are very close to your finger uh, tips, you want to be t them to be touching, so otherwise they will fall. Uh, so these are the two basic uh, physics knowledge that we try to integrate in the network as a, as a loss, loss function. Um, yeah, as I said, the, the hand model is a differentiable hand model, and it, it decomposes the shape deformations and pose deformations into two, as before. Um, and the work we use uh, is AtlasNet uh, for object reconstruction into unit uh, normalized vertices. It actually deforms a sphere, like it inputs the coordinates of a sphere, XYZ coordinates, and then outputs their deformation in the uh, in our prediction, so it's it's pretty simple as well, um, and it's it's quite flexible. So you can deal with many object categories at the same time, except that you cannot have uh, holes. Like we can only deal with topology zero in this case. So it, mugs and some up kind of objects will be uh, will not be possible, but otherwise it's it's quite flexible. And uh, for the contact loss, the physics uh, metrics, we use uh, this two losses together that are actually um, competing with each other, and those are attraction. So, as I said, if we don't want the object to fall, we want to attract the fingers to the object. And the other is repulsion, so we don't want the penetrated uh, vertices to be inside the object, so we repulse them. So, the, like, um, they look at the distance of the closest vertex to the object, vice versa, and then try to balance such that it's actually touching but not, not violating any physics rules. And uh, in this case, we have the synthetic data set that we call Obman for object manipulations. Uh, we use similar techniques with the software, as I mentioned, Blender, and a parametric model, hand model. But in this case, there is um, an additional challenge because we want the objects to be in the interaction, and we want to generate them automatically. Um, and the way we do that is, we, we go back to some robotics tools. So in robotics, um, they have already a tool which they call GraspIt, that given a random object, gives you a possible, physically plausible hand configuration, so that it, it's grasping and not falling and not penetrating, etc. So we use this to scale up our data set creation. We mine uh, like 3,000 object instances from um, CAD model ShapeNet dataset, so there are a lot of uh, thousands of object, object instances, and we select actually some hand, like uh, it's um, graspable objects uh, from them, and automatically create um, grasps. So with that, we can train a neural network, like the one I showed before, and. Uh, tested on images like this, and compare uh, whether the contact loss helps or not 
So this is with the contact loss, this is without the contact loss. I don't know if you can see. The red regions denote the penetrations. And it's even harder to see the contact, but you have to trust me that um, qu quantitatively with experiments, we validated uh, um, both of them to be helpful. And more interestingly, here I'm showing images, uh, training only with synthetic data on random categories. And we can look at, again, the failures and success cases. We see that, so this is a video, but we do it frame by frame for each video, each image we predicted separately, so it's going to be jittering. But we realized that it's actually quite robust to different clutters, like backgrounds and lights, because in our synthetic data, we put a lot of effort to randomize these kind of things so that it doesn't overfit. But what we cannot do is actually we have uh, still some limited um, hand poses because they're automatically generated from the grasp bit. There's still some, some bias towards certain grasps in, in that software. So some grasps like this sometimes would never appear They're, because it's trying to optimize physics quality. It's, it tends to grasp everything, even the pinky always like, touches the object to make sure it doesn't fall. But in real life, actually, we have certain ways of holding some objects, like the knife, we, we don't like hold it in from the, um, or the pen, we always hold it. We call them affordances, so there are certain ways people grasp objects, and these, uh, because it's an automatic creation, we don't have those statistics. So hand poses was the main uh, failure case. I would say also the object shapes is limited because it's quite coarse. Um, without knowing what object this is, it's, it's really hard to say this is a can, um, because from a 2D projection, it, it's really hard to, it's an ambiguous task anyways. So you need to be a bit more category aware to be able to produce high quality objects. But this was already quite interesting to see. Um, yeah, maybe I'll, I'll skip that, I'll already talk about some failure cases. And some open problems is, yeah, like the object quality. We, we don't know what category it is. And as you might guess, if we had more than one image, uh, like a video, we could also improve the quality of, uh, of the reconstruction because actually a video is kind of a, a multi-view setup because as you move your hand, you s start to look at more and more sides of the object so you can improve the quality of your object as well. And yeah, affordances, as I said, we need to have real statistics of grasps. And in this case, it was a single hand with a single object, but of course we do, we use all our hands um, to interact with objects. And this is the, one of the next steps. And action recognition, so more like understanding the dynamics of as the next step. So that will be my next and last part. Um, yeah, so in action recognition, um, this is a recent work, a collaboration between University of Oxford, where I am, and INRIA. Um, um, recent work on using synthetic humans, again, that is free training data, but for action classification. So the, the way we, well, the, we formulate first the problem that you have an, a video, so the, here I'm showing images, but there are all videos, uh, you have a label already in your real training data, and this is from a specific viewpoint, so like the front view, for, for instance, this is a typical bias of cameras capturing, but you might have at your test data things from another viewpoint which you have never seen in your training. Imagine like a surveillance scenario where you have a camera installed and you've annotated hours of data from this for stealing actions in a supermarket, and one day you decide to install another camera from this side, and you cannot re-annotate re things. So you want to be able to generalize from one, one viewpoint to another, and it's quite challenging. So we, th we thought that this is a spe specific case for, uh, a specific case of having low real data regime, uh, and we can easily augment that with synthetically, because if you have a 3D model of a person, we can rotate it randomly and have infinitely many views. So, but a challenge is that how do you get action label for your synthetic images? Because before in the surreal data set, we have only annotations for like segmentation, depth, but none of them for actions. Um, 
and we thought we can get them from real data sets which are already annotated. But then how do you get the person out from that uh, videos because it's quite challenging to get the 3D. Before we were using motion capture and like those expensive studios, but um, so the thanks, thanks to the, well maybe, yeah. Uh, thanks to the current methods, as I showed before, like on 3D human shape estimation, there have been some re advances also on shape estimation from videos, which were actually quite well. We can extract uh, parametric models from videos and then use all these augmentations on clothes, cameras, viewpoints, and to render different viewpoints. And the reason we wanted to focus so much on viewpoints is this observation that if you train on only one viewpoint and test on a completely different viewpoint, you fail dramatically. Like state-of-the-art neural network trained on zero viewpoint here, like this image, and tested on um, side view, 90 degree image, almost like a goes to half the performance. So you, you have a deceive, like you get uh, mis misled that our, my network performs really well, it's 80%, but then completely fails on, on different viewpoints. Um, th so that's why we want to work on this setup, and our goal is to improve this, this number. Um, yeah, some illustration of the augmentations, similar to before, is like viewpoints, shape, background, clothes, but in this case, we also want to augment the motions because one action, like the hand-waving action, can be done in very different ways. And we use actually very simple things like additive noise on the angles between your joints, and like um, we also explore other things, and we show that uh, diversity in motion is quite important. Um, so in this case, we call our data set Surreact, a surreal uh, synthetic data set for uh, actions in this case. And as you can see, if we have already a real data set with actions, we can generate more uh, samples from that and have more diversity. These are some video examples from NTU data set, which is in a very specific uh, room, and mostly yeah, to study the cross view training with one view and testing with other view uh, case. And you can see that we can, well, it's a bit jittery and noisy, but we can extract the 3D pretty well and, and yeah, like augment it in so many different ways. Similar thing for another data set, UESTC data set. We can transfer the very precise uh, fine-grained action classes synthetically, um, and these are different viewpoints, 0, 45, and 90. Um, another data set is kinetics. So this kinetics is like a very large scale uh, data set from YouTube. It's very unconstrained and challenging, also challenging to get the person, 3D person out, but we use um, a very small subset and study uh, one-shot learning uh, in this case, like where you have only one training sample per category. <laughs> and yeah, like the, the classes are super weird also, like you have th 10 different types of dancing and push-ups. <laughs> okay. Um, yeah, so, Back to experiments, we wanted to show in this case that training both on both data sets um, is better than training only on real. So here, real is, is the pink curve, and synthetic plus real is the green curve. Training only on synthetic is the blue curve. We have three plots for testing on front view, which is the easiest one, and a less easy, but 45 degree unseen viewpoint and a 90 degree challenging unseen viewpoint. We can see that if we have, so like here is the number of sequences per action, so on the x-axis you have more diversity in motions, more and more data, and the y-axis is the performance, the accuracy uh, percentage of correctly classified actions, and this is like 60 action categories data set. Um, yeah, so if, let's, let's look at maybe like, in the, 
this data point where you train only with real with 100 sequences per action. So you annotated 100 times 60 videos. And then you, you decide, okay, let's do 100 more. So you move to here and you get from 49% to 54%. But instead, you could already use the existing videos, existing annotations, and augment them synthetically and get to 60, 62%. So like, uh, we thought this is like a free, cheap, and effective way to improve your performance, especially on unseen viewpoints, but even on the scene viewpoint, adding more data like usually helps. Um, and it shows that even with synthetic data set, we can get to 50% performance. And it's surprising that when these like uh, completely well unrealistic videos uh, with training only with them, you can already generalize to to real videos. Yeah, as I mentioned, we look at this motion diversity effect, and one experiment with that is that so I sh I show number of sequences per action, so it could be 10 sequences per action, uh, and then 60 sequences per action, you have a big jump in like 10%, 15% improvement. Uh, the question is whether this is because there's more data or this is because there's more motions or what is it? And we rendered this, this 10 sequences six times to get the same amount of data as this. And we thought that there's more close light viewpoint diversity this time, but it's actually like marginally improving over the baseline. So it's like 2% improvement. Um, so that really means that the motion diversity is important. So the same class can be done in very different ways. And we try to experiment with different ways of increasing this diversity. One is interpolation, one is additive noise. So additive noise is the one I mentioned, like changing uh, the, the angles between joints slightly, but without disturbing so much, otherwise hand waving and brushing teeth will be very similar. So it's, well, we had to be careful about that. And interpolation is, is something interesting. We wanted to check, but it didn't work so well. Um, is using the same um, two pairs of actions from the same class, like sitting action for two different individuals. And you first align them in time so that they roughly do the same action at the same time. And also interpolate between them to create a new one. So if a person sits down with hands like this, another one sits down like this, it, you will get something in between. So it, it will give you more data and less overfitting. And it was kind of working, but not as well as additive noise, which is actually easier just to uh, implement also. Yeah, so with that, I think, yeah, I'm going to wrap up. And a, f a few feature directions about this work, it, it made us realize that we have to be able to look more into generative models of actions. So we rely a lot on motion capture studios for having sources of motion sequences, but we can learn to generate with these like um, GANs or like recently popular generative models. We should be able to generate motion sequences. And there are some works that cr like generate sequences, but un unconstrained sequences of walking or like a lot of walking actually and running, but it, in our case, it should be action condition generation because we don't want to generate anything but we want to generate from a certain class. And there can be really fine-grained, as I said, like a motion of brushing teeth and eating something. It's, it's quite similar in body pose. And the other thing is that, yeah, our hypothesis, our, our assumption was that the body, model, the body motion uh, gives us the, the information about the action. But actually there are other things, especially in, like in this YouTube videos, you have the objects or the scene, like the way a certain dance action is done relies a lot about the, the clothes, like what type of clothes do you wear for, I don't know, ballet or like some other uh, dances. So, and in our case, we assume we only have body motions and the rest we assume to be random. Um, but with the, again, with these generative models, we can be able to simulate also contextual cues um, so like playing violin without a violin, it's going to be difficult um, to, to, to predict. Yeah, so with that, I would like to conclude and can take questions. Thank you.